aire. Bueno, buenos días a todas y todos los que nos estén viendo eh, virtualmente. Eh, bienvenidas y bienvenidos los participantes del panel, Filipe Reñé, José Carlos Mariátegui, Cuauhtémoc Medina, Patricia Rousseau, Celina Chatruc, Iker Saizdedos, Matilde Sánchez, Alejandro Grimson, y esperemos que en cualquier momento pueda incorporarse Estrella de Diego, también desde Madrid, que está con problemas técnicos. Esta tercera reunión del ciclo de Encuentros Bienal Sur es de alguna manera la forma que adoptamos en las actuales circunstancias eh, en las que no se estaban dando evidentemente las condiciones global con la masividad este, y la cantidad de asistentes y el contacto físico y todo lo que nos caracterizaba. Pero los estamos haciendo porque cuando empezó todo esto nos plantearon, se plantearon en relación a las distintas actividades que llevaban adelante eh, si tenía o no tenía sentido la continuidad. Y rápidamente decidimos que sí, que tenía sentido que, que Bien al Sur siguiera, que tenía sentido seguir adelante con el proyecto de hacer la tercera edición en el año 2021, como, eh, como correspondía. Eh, y entonces, eh, preparando esa tercera edición, iniciamos esta serie de encuentros. ¿Y por qué definimos que era conveniente o que era lógico seguir adelante con Bien al Sur. No solo esto podría ser un, un aspecto eh, específico, pero no solo porque miles de artistas nos plantearon de muy diferentes lugares del mundo, más de 60 países, este, si los proyectos que ya me habían enviado iban a tener, este, se iba a realizar la Bienal y se iban a poder hacer, y que además y muchos más que se contactaban para ver si podían seguir mandando proyectos. Pero no solo por eso, sino fundamentalmente porque Bien al Sur fue la creación de un hecho global que más que nunca en este momento es importante porque estamos ante un mundo que se está cerrando y no solo por motivos sanitarios, que podría ser lógico que se cerrara por motivos sanitarios, sino que se está cerrando mucho más aún desde el punto de vista político. Estamos ante un mundo que no ha podido elaborar una estrategia conjunta entre diversos países para llevar adelante la lucha en, este, contra la pandemia. Eh, es decir, un mundo que está demostrando que estamos cada vez más lejos los unos de los otros. Eh, un mundo eh, que evidentemente no podemos, sería absurdo negar que el, uno de los resultados de, de esta pandemia es que van a aumentar las desigualdades las desigualdades que ya eran más que, más que graves en la mayoría de, de los países del mundo, que acaban a aumentar, y sobre todo que va a aumentar los problemas este, con, lo, con todo aquello que tiene que ver con las, eh, la diversidad cultural. Eh, en, en muchos de los países que hay aquí en el panel representantes, un caso típico de ellos sería Brasil, pero por supuesto también Estados Unidos y muchos más, están empezando a recrearse formas de xenofobia, formas de racismo, formas de desprecio por los humildes. Y en el marco de todo eso, bien al sur, que es un proyecto basado en la promoción del, dere del derecho a la cultura y, a la, y la promoción de la diversidad cultural, nos pareció que era más que lógico plantearnos más que nunca seguir adelante con Bien al Sur y encarar la tercera edición en el 2021. Eh, podríamos decir mucho más, pero en síntesis, que hay un momento en el que plantearse la democratización del arte y la cultura, que hay un momento en el que plantearse eh, la posibilidad de que el arte y la cultura lleguen a las grandes mayorías y que el arte y la cultura se, se planteen con el criterio de ser algo comunitario. Cuando digo algo comunitario, José María Luna, among them, they talked how desperate they were in absence of tourism, who on earth would visit museums. And this is related to something we already discussed in some 
some of these meetings. What about culture and tourism? Uh, it's far better for tourists to be able to go to museums, but touristization of culture, this phenomenon has to do with museums that haven't worked to reach out their radius of action to their own communities. They just followed a commercial line. They just wanted to sell in the box office. And this is why we said that we wish that after this, sufficient changes will ensue so that exhibition rooms will continue to be the fundamental element of museums, so that they are not considered from the point of view that some museums have, that it is more important to sell in the este, y eh, por la venta de elementos de merchandising. En todo este marco, que voy a hacer corto para no, este, para no extenderme, en todo este marco, como les decía antes, pensamos que era eh, muy bueno, que era muy necesario que siguiéramos con, con el esfuerzo que, que venimos haciendo, esfuerzo muy grande, casi desmedido, en función de los pocos que somos quienes estamos en el equipo de Bien al Sur, eh, y de todas las dificultades de todo tipo que tenemos, pero que pensamos que a pesar de ello era más que lógico que siguiéramos adelante. Así que les quiero agradecer a todos los participantes por su colaboración, por el tiempo que nos dedican, y agradecerle por el nombre de Diana y en el mío, y en, el, y en nombre de todo el equipo de Bien al Sur, y le dejo la palabra a Diana para que nos marque y nos coordine elementos disparadores de la discusión y la coordine. Gracias Aníbal, gracias a todos por estar aquí, los que están de este lado de la pantalla en, 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 el, en el mosaico y los que están de, del otro lado en sus casas. Eh, y quería, quería marcar tres cuestiones que son, eh, si en el primer encuentro, nosotros cuando lanzamos estos encuentros nos imaginamos que, como decía Aníbal, que, que podía ser un aporte invitar a, a dialogar, como veníamos haciéndolo desde que votamos Bien al Sur o empezamos a transitar el proceso de Bien al Sur, que todo el tiempo se está pensando en sí mismo, eh, en 2015. En el momento que a armar esta inicial reunión, nos dimos cuenta que pudimos hacer una trilogía de algún tipo de trilogy. This is the third point in this trilogy, where under the concept of thinking, possible futures, whether we are organizing them conceptually, then I can say that the first meeting had to do with uh, considering the status of affairs. It revealed a number of traits that were present at the time, and I'd like to underscore the condition of resiliency and also been in a situation that would force us to get adapted, to adjust, um, though how strange we may feel. The second meeting, we invited people to think about how this new condition we are forced to live in modifies our perception of the world, of those around us, of others especially if we think about art and culture, the thing is how these representations pop up the surface. And on this meeting, we are inviting you, especially so that we can think together how these narratives have been created in this sort of continuous present. If we are to take the starting point um, on some, well, I should say that by late February, we had a text of Agamer that thought one of the lines of thought, it would be kind of apocalyptic. Uh, they talked about the beginning of the end, an end that goes to the ending of any possibility for human conditions. I'm talking about this in extreme situations so as to summarize and to give some sort of mark in time to the construction of these narratives. And on the next day, February 26th, uh, this got published, and on the 27th of February, Sisek came out with a far more hopeful perspective. He thought about um, the crisis of neo-capitalism or neoliberal capitalism and prospects onto a new way or a new world order. So between these two extreme positions, uh, these are the first few 
but the ones that were kind of trend setters to trails in between um, which we have hues, as you all know, we all were stakeholders, participants of this process of promotion and creation of narratives from uh, the publication of uh, conspiracies. I mean, if we come to think about it, the first one was the Wuhan soup by late March in April. Other publications came about, several blogs, newspapers and journals mapped out the whole thing, uh, Matilde Sánchez uh, on Clarina Neñe and Cruz on La Nación. Uh, they have shown us, and Iker Seistedos as well, and Felipe Renier by Learning Paper, they have shown us the day-to-day follow-up on the status of a especially in the field of culture, but also in the field of general opinion. And at the same time, compilations were gathered that tried to integrate those thoughts, such as those independent publications, such as Wuhan Soup, or the one that was published by Argentina Futuro, to think about the situation following COVID-19. All these outlooks, in a way, take different topics, but there are two that, in my opinion, appear on different positions almost always. Inequality and frailty. And when it comes to frailty, we have uh, the gender perspective that is quite present as an activation of a problem that we have been discussing about, but which becomes more readily perceivable in this context and also frailty of an environment which in turn paradoxically so has been the one that has been taking up many hours, many um, mindsets of production of symbolism, the field of art and culture and cultural industry and how frail the sector is, which we see in many countries. They are coming out to be recovered or contained or supported, but this is part and parcel of the problem. So let's have a five-minute um, round assigned to each of you. I'll give the floor to Cuauhtémoc first, so we can participate in our sharing of outlooks on this subject, and then we could attempt to engage in dialogue, much the same way we did when we were all sitting around a table. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank you for creating uh, this platform and for bringing us together, no matter how distant we may be from one another. We are actually closer than what seems at first sight. Well, I wanted to react a little on the title that you have suggested, Imagining Possible Futures. My reaction walks along the line that I should thank you for having in front of me something that I find necessary. It is necessary to dispel any doubts. We are in a paradox. I see that this happens in many places, and I feel some sort of interior conflict inside me. I mean, the first truly global event has happened already, where some radical change, some disruption, has gave as a result an experience that is uh, unheard of or unpublished, and it wouldn't be exaggerated on our part to call it this way. There is no fine tuning so far for us to give it a lay. the 
future coming has been procrastinated. It has turned into something that is about to happen. Conditions where we will be able to establish our possibilities are about to be created, but especially what uh, is uh, more necessary for us to define is the social players, social actors. We are being faced uh, with um, eloquent, simple and terrible data here. On the one hand, we have this awkward experience. The first coordinated action that is a global one. This is what this quarantine is all about. It is the first decision um, it's one decision uh, that was made in a, this very wide radius, but then we are also faced to social progress, and in the majority they are built based on a deformed agent, so to speak. We have a situation where having generated societies that are unequal from a material point of view, but also under leadership that is based in ignorance and in emotional manipulation, and in generating distrust on the possibility of generating common fields for reflection, we have generated a society that is very, very unillustrated. And all of a sudden, this backfires on us because this secures that powers will continue to exist when they are ineffective and suicidal, when the situation, as a matter of fact, is a limit. Uh, a border it situation as the one we are living through. It is in this framework that the question on what is the role of cultural field um, to play here, it is absolutely necessary for us to get started to appreciate not just the role of accompanying people, uh, it's a need actually to have the cultural field. And the fact is that the only way we know to generate uh, awareness, raising and thinking that is aware and to generate a discussion that is not based on individual identities, having an understanding on something that is beyond human is culture, the cultural field, the artistic field, in its own complexity, within its noise and no matter how absurd it may be. What I'm trying to say here is that this assumption to imagine the future bears with it the problem that is it is procrastinated. Why is that so? Because the cultural field has to be established. And let me underscore this. I don't know whether you are of the same mind of me, but I should say that one of the first few experiences in this lockdown time has been that it hasn't been passive at all in connection to the struggle, conflicts, demonstrations, and um, people moving out to express themselves. So what is happening in connection to police violence in many places around the world, Mexico included, means that the possibility to take action is limited by being locked down. But people would take the streets uh, in a Hegelian challenge. They jeopardize their own survival because something more serious than them, the condition of human worthiness and vi viability of the social contract is at stake. But even from the lockdown, many of us have been engaged in politics. Politics against the way in which the design of the distribution of social resources does not only promote inequality, but also it promotes to continue to build a citizenship that is not well trained, that is not well attuned in order to keep having a manipulated democratic structure. This is what we are facing in Mexico on a project that uh, follows uh, the left wing. And on that, I'd like to be very clear. We have to give up on uh, this relationship to manipulate our future prospects that is being built by the left wing in Latin America. We continue to have a tradition and under the label of quote unquote popular, it involves this paramount confusion, this paramount confusion between critique and inequality and anti-intellectualism. It involves the quest for personifying sovereignty that will vindicate social differences in a logic of uh, anger or rancor. 
and it cannot produce structures that are fitting for a rational society. And in the Mexican case, this is expressed because we find artists and universities and intellectuals as subjects that are not sufficiently tamed, so to speak. So one of the problems we have is how to generate a social field that should not be at the mercy of that moment of subjection, where we understand that we have to generate a critical field that will not just have a, uh, any other effect but the practical one, that of facing decisions and tasks meant by trying to enable some sort of survival. And this will require collective, massive effort that will require a great capacity to be rational and to be aware of what is around us. Thank you, Cuauhtémoc. He was kind of restless and, I mean, Jose Carlos was kind of restless and trying to silently uh, take part and will follow on the Andean corridor. Thank you, thank you, Bienal Sur, for generating these spaces of dialogue. Aníbal, Diana, the entire team and colleagues here. As I was listening to this, I could think of a small book by Hoover Dreyfus, philosopher and a translator of Heidegger for those of us that could not otherwise read his books. And there is one book that's called On the Internet. I read it for the first time in 2001. And then Dreyfus, who died uh, pretty old, uh, he was beyond 90s, 90, he rewrote it in 2013 because he said that there were many things that didn't work anymore, that didn't make any sense. I read it a while ago thinking it was much better than the one in 2001. But then I realized that there were things that made no sense. The text in 2001 continues to be a little bit more interesting because there was some sort of speculative factor and maybe there would be some naivete around this. But we should try and rewrite time and time again. Time runs very fast now. Agamba text could be widely challenged because the things that we have seen in the last few months have gone beyond our knowledge and our capacity to take action. Cuauhtémoc has just mentioned something important. This is not passive time. I don't think that any one of you may have had time to read, to rest, to relax, to harness this time as a time to be aloof from reality. That's actually not the case. We have lived through a far more dense reality. People are out there to denounce. And in Latin America, people go out there to eat, to make a living uh, in our societies where the degree of people who have to make a living or who have to make ends meet on a daily basis is enormous. So these are quite complex situations. And here we have come across all this. I was listening to Saskia Sassen, the sociologist uh, from Netherlands, uh, uh, but she was actually born in Argentina. And she repeated the same old things. We have crossed the limits in the system. And it's an invitation for us to sit down and think. But at to some point, we are in front of something we don't see. It's the invisible, the microbe. I mean, this was already stated in by Latour uh, in the book on pasteurization in France. But it's interesting to say that today, in connection to this bug, I mean, we always are confronted not just with the physical realm, but with some disasters. We are catastrophic. Human beings have been worried by floods, uh, fires, disasters, but we still are confronted with the invisible. And that is not just so in connection to this microbe that in a way navigates, so to speak, it sets sails 
in a fluid manner and we cannot fully grasp or understand and it has affected all of us. But at the same time, it connects to what is happening in science. And I'd like to also incorporate in the cultural discussion the scientific factor in a world where we increasingly are mediated in order to understand the invisible. So the level of abstraction that we are having on the virus is the same level of abstraction that we are having on many of the things we don't get to see in the scientific field. And we are trying to find a reason. We are trying to gain an insight, an understanding. This somehow makes us assume or rethink a number of models, many of them. We have to take a look at what is essential. It's some sort of uh, the plus tide, some sort of a new approach, trying to find new horizons, but it's a way to rethink them as well. And we have to be very judgmental here with how citizens play a role here and how us from museums or from spaces of culture, from our position of citizens, take a way to reconsider the relation between us, public policies. How did we realize that public policies, especially in Latin America, have demonstrated to be totally inefficacious? And even though we may talk, and I'll talk about uh, at the end of this neoliberal model, but I should say there's this crisis of us being incapable, we as cultural players or as citizens that are closer to this progressist kind of uh, thinking or left-wing kind of thinking. There is this disciplinary regulatory uh, culture that is not easy to break with. We cannot easily change it. So the pandemic revealed this frailty. It revealed how frail our cultural system is, and it has expressed the precarious and almost non-existent capacity to react. So without a doubt, there is a discussion going on here, and we will, of course, expand on it over the course of our discussion when we open up to the panel. But I do think there is an opportunity, one, to discuss our position in the museum, how we can get closer to local knowledge. We've been immersed in this expansive, abstract kind of global world, but to what an extent can we rethink the whole thing? Now we will move far less, now that we will be forced to to stay in confined, I mean, in a local space for a longer time. How do we come closer to local knowledge? How do we understand the physical space? These are ways we can come back to traditional cultures, this millinery knowledge. I believe um, there is a big space that remains, a very interesting one for discussion that has not yet been tapped or explored where cultures converge, culture and art and science. Very good, thank you. I'd like to invite Alejandro, so the three of you are in a row, so uh, let me be elegant in how I decide who goes next. Good morning, good afternoon to you all. It's my pleasure to take the floor. Thank you for inviting me. I think there's a lot we have to think about. In my own case, as Diana mentioned, from the program in the Argentine government on the future of Argentina, we published a book that was uh, over a month ago, plus 25 different authors thinking about the future after COVID-19. And I have several things to say, not just in connection to the book, but in connection to many of the things that have already been stated. There is a sin on the part of some intellectuals, I would say. This is that when something appeared, as was stated here, that is so widely unknown as COVID-19 is, it's a, such a paramount global phenomenon 
rather than opening up your mind to thinking about this new reality, they raise their hands and say, the theory I wrote 20 years ago has just been confirmed. And this is one of the greatest sins we can ever make when being intellectuals, because it's coming out and saying in front of this burst, of this burst of what is new, is to come and say that the response is something that had already that we had already thought decades ago, as if new knowledge couldn't ever exist, as if there couldn't be any sort of reflection down the road. And of course, we are all used to having an impact uh, of central countries being arrogant and being disruptive in the south part of the world, taking up a big portion of the agenda. In Argentina, some continue to discuss who was right back in February, when many other things have already been stated. Many other notions have been put on the table ever since. And I think that additionally to that, one of the questions that should be answered is, what about the possible futures and what about the desirable futures? And I truly believe that even though neither question can be solely answered in a single manner. It is at least good to try and separate them, separate between them. Why? Because what used to be called globalization, well, I remember David Harvey defined it as a process of temporal and space compression, an increasingly smaller world. Nonetheless, coronavirus proved us wrong. The world became increasingly big. I mean, it's some sort of space and time transformation in a reverse manner, even though it is, as a matter of fact, the first global phenomenon on this sense, far more than 2001 or far more than any other we can ever remember. Nonetheless, in my opinion, it's failure. Of course, there are some exceptions to the rule, the lack of capacity to react in front of this. On the other hand, I remember the term used by Marc Ocher when he mentioned this idea of the conscience of what is contemporary. And while the movement we live through right now goes reversely from space and time compression, there is some sort of conscience of contemporaneity that might be more remarkable day by day. I believe that what has been stated here is very clear. All inequalities are aggravated in the context we are going through, economic and social inequalities, ethnic and racial inequalities, gender inequalities, inequalities in sexual orientation, in terms of age or on the space each and every one of us live in. So this is where we seriously see how inequalities are affected. They are exposed quite dramatically so in many circumstances. And that at the same time brings about a major challenge for us intellectuals meaning how do we face what is the state? What is the state after all? I'm of those who think that when, think, when I think about wishable futures or when I think about possible futures, I'm almost positive for a number of reasons and it would be very lengthy for me to go over them. But historical experience shows that a crisis of this sort turns the world different forever but I don't know whether it will turn far worse or whether it will turn a little better. This is my main doubt. It might be worse, of course, I have no doubt about that. Can it be a little better? Well, of course, part of it can be true. It depends on us because when someone believes that the future is written or predetermined uh, or secure, then you lose any power as a subject. If you think that future is full uncertain, fully uncertain, uh, that 
you cannot have any impact as a player, then you lose your capacity as a subject. And here there is something we should say. What is the state? What about public health? What about society, solidarity, and freedom? All this is under discussion right now. I perceive some intellectuals who consider that being an intellectual is being critical of the power uh, in bold, and that the power is always in the hand of the state. Well, there is something there that I never fully understood, and I understand it far less today, because in face of these global disasters, states have reacted quite differently. Some have say, um, long live economy and coronavirus does whatever you want, and others have attempted a preventive quarantine, others an emergency quarantine. So I see different states that are positioned in different ways. And if you would even correlate them to the supposed ideological traditions uh, from the different uh, perspectives, then matrix would be <coughs> quite a mess. So what is the state? The state, is it the power and uh, should our critique always be against uh, the state? It depends on our position. If you are of the idea that it is better to have prevented quarantine rather than the laissez-faire for coronavirus, then you should be critical based on that position rather than on anything that the state should be doing should be subject matter for criticism. Of course, we always have to be critical, but what I mean is something different. What I'm saying here is that the idea that no matter what the government does, that always should be the subject matter of my critique as an intellectual, then it's very challenging, very bold and peculiar, because many times we have seen how processes have existed where the powers are clearly outside from the state or even against the state. So I believe that among the desirable or the possible futures, I do have a number of ideas that come uh, from my political ideas, thinking about how we can ever build a world that will be less unequal in economic terms, in terms of gender, and in terms of ethnicity and racial notions. That is how we can think about processes that are not that centric on financial capital, but more on human beings, on communities, and on solidarity. That is a paramount challenge, because what we have had so far is, rather than solidarity, is an exacerbation of nationalism and a reinforcement on borders. And when it comes to that, I believe that we have paramount challenges to overcome. So we can think about what potential futures are and what desirable futures are like. I am quite sure that this initiative of the Anal Sur, as well as many other initiatives that can be out there in the region and in the country, are quite critical. Why is that so? Because there are states, there are governments, there are social players, there's everything. But without an idea on the future, we cannot ever build a future. And we need to discuss them widely in a plural manner and with a critical call and with generosity and being very candid. But we need to encourage those discussions. We need to encourage that production because if there is something that the world needs badly today, as much as it needs economy and production and being able to face out from the more critical and dramatic situations, we need to have an idea of where we want to be headed for, what type of future we want to have after the virus. Thank you, Alejandro, that's no doubt true. Before I give the floor to Philippe, he's quite restless, when I talked about uh, the starting perspective, c second gambit, I just wanted to show this temporal mark and to show that as a matter of fact, yesterday when having an exercise, when I went over these texts, 
I came across one that is quite nice, Horacio Gonzalez, with a wonderful text on Antigona answered Gambin again. Uh, this was in May 11th. Gambin's remark is like a radical uh, old person who is uh, focused on uh, challenging our current moves. And this is along the lines of what you were saying in the beginning of your presentation. Nonetheless, and by thinking about potential futures, what's possible in connection to desire, I mean, what we are looking for, uh, we try to design uh, as a result of this condition, whereas Jose Carlo was saying, no one stayed a very easy Initially, they said these are not vacations, and they clearly are not vacations. So how whatever is possible uh, is, in a way, promoted by all these voices. And I commend the fact that there are so many publications and so many voices that will invite us to discuss with them, activating the critical perspective. Philippe. Good morning to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Aníbal. I'd like to thank the entire team in Biennale Sur for giving me the floor this morning. My point of view is pretty European in connection to the lockdown in France. There is an addition that says Canada, Canada Switzerland, Belgium. All the countries in Africa. And we implemented a device The country was at a lockdown between March 17 and May 11. For the first time after the Second World War, all museums were closed, all agencies had closed. They weren't able to receive any visitors. And for museum directors, it was an unheard of situation to have to keep working to continue forward with their mission without opening up their doors to people. The Minister of Culture in France enabled a device, a virtual one, I mean, that was called Culture at Home, where all institutions were invited to create, specifically on the web, specific visits to the exhibitions. Um, they talked about history of art and viewpoints on some collections, especially the French collections. As you know that in France, there are lots of regional collections on contemporary art. And all this was down on the line. I mean, there were elements, comments, critiques on collections. So without a doubt, 40 different people I interviewed during this period created at the same time uh, their present. They talked about their present and they talked about reinventing. And they were also thinking about futures. And uh, that gets articulated on three different points. These personalities, um, museum directors, talked about uh, the digital realm, how to develop more content from a pedagogical perspective in order to enable at the same time um, those who are socially or geographically precluded from having access to art, how to enable them a way into art and then to create new virtual tools in order to create access to culture, without a doubt. The museum director of art and history in Geneva said, we have to create a balance today between the world that goes digital and the real world. 
at the same time as is the case today we are lucky with virtual we can combine in an efficacious manner the local and the global one we have access to pieces to local pieces and we do have access as well to content to international content that has been proposed by other museums proposed by other institutions by other biennials we can visit virtually so we see that from the perspective of the market of art all the developments and all the exhibitions and fairs that got cancelled and we have virtually so access to creations of artists based on the virtual world so we're going to see what gets developed why would that be so because the, the fair that would take place in September has been cancelled, but it won't happen this year. It was moved to 2021. And another aspect is solidarity. I believe that this period, this being a reflection period, is one where you realize how difficult it is for us to work. I mean, uh, lots of people who work in the field of art, artists have to work in a precarious manner because of the lockdown, the total stagnation of economy, and these institutions, as a matter of fact, said that for them it was a priority to help artists today also having a look at the local scene. I'm talking about proximity artists, because in France, there is quite an international look on art. This aspect meant the right to show, meaning, I mean, artists who would exhibit would receive a fee in exchange for showing their pieces. Frequently so in exhibitions, artists uh, exhibit for free. And then what got highly developed was some sort of um, interruption of exhibitions. Uh, we returned back to collections to the local collections, uh, that is the museum collections, we work far more on collections themselves. And we put an end to the big international exhibitions. We stopped them. We interviewed Maria Bergeau de la Paix, and she said that today she would move on to a far longer temporality. Exhibitions will last for far longer. That's the bottom line message. And some people, some curators also said that they would stop or interrupt a production that was kind of a, the trend setter. So slowing down speed this being a concept of modernity. So maybe at this day and age, we have to go to something that will be slower. We have to shift one gear down. We have to globally uh, try to go slower about it in order for us to take into consideration ecology considerations, transportation, and whatnot. Of course, it's very expensive for the planet to keep moving the way we have been moving before this day and age. So some reflections have been exposed in meetings like this. And I believe that today we are fully aware of the whole thing. The schemes that had been the ones in place for a few years now are no longer convenient, are no longer suitable for the years that will come ahead. Very good. Thank you very much, Philippe. Matilde is now a little restless, so I'll give the floor to her. Hello, Annibal. Hello, Diana. Thank you so much for inviting me. 
I'll give you um, a hug from my distance to all participants. I was following up on conversations in Yuntrev, also the ones in Malba and some others as well. And I was thinking about the following. F future, uh, possible futures. I'd like to go back to something that Cuauhtemo said last week. And I thought it was very interesting and we have to apply it as days go by. I was thinking futures, uh, possible futures. It's almost impossible for me to think about the future. I mean, it's impossible to give it accuracy. So I came down to some sort of personal idea that in a way expressed what we have been seeing in the last three months. The idea of the recent present, that is a present that became a past at a snapshot, I mean, hardly back in February. And even though, Diana, you were mentioning some sort of the two big lines of thoughts, she exemplified it with Agamben and then with Sisek. I think that there is one third position. I personally don't see it as a possibility, but maybe it is. Why not? Maybe we will go back to the recent present. And I would think it would be an atrocity if that would ever happen, having gone through this experience without being able to learn something. In my own vital history, it's a unique experience. Then I'll talk about the landmarks that are suggestive of uh, what we have not yet left in the past. But it would be horrible to think that everything will go back to normal and that the recent present would be uh, reset, so to speak, without a capacity to have any memory of the lived experience. And along those lines, I should say, my professional life, I've been working as a professional for 30 years, and I brought some notes I took, and I hope you don't mind if I read them out loud. I think that in terms of uh, Marcos's quote that Alejandro reminded us of the experience of the contemporary, that feeling in English, well, it's actually not English, but in English they call it momentum, this bringing together of energies, so to speak. But much at the same time, it has uh, the shade of a coexistence, a joint effort, no matter how many flaws there might be to this. If I have to think about examples that preceded these energies and these happenings, then I have to think about the fall of the Berlin Wall, even far more than the Twin Towers, or even more um, the assault to Charlie Hebdo or Atocha or the Bataclan attack. We still don't know how this will translate in terms of future economy, far less so for Argentina, having a crisis that precedes the whole thing. At times, the outlooks are quite grimsome. So thinking about uh, the life of museums under this regime, well, it would be a utopia for the time being. But even though we still don't know how the whole thing will translate for uh, us, uh, the media, we do know what kind of journalism we are going to. Let's refresh our memory. I wanted to mention something about how this was lived and what the challenge is and what the peril is. The fall of the Berlin War in two or three years, it massively expanded and it manufactured the digital culture. It meant an expansion of resources for journalism. Unlike this moment where there are effects, where agendas will get unified, where topics will be uh, put on the same line, we will narrow, even when it expands things, it narrows our focus on all the things we are looking for. All journalists have adopted alongside um, our thinking of different topics, subjects such as epidemiology, 
uh, narratives that are quite imperative. Demography, an old new discipline that all of a sudden has us uh, consider or reconsider urbanizations. Demography would be a subject on its own right. It used to be a discipline that believed uh, was very much actualized. And all of a sudden, statistics are put forward on the first plane, and then many corners disappear because of this hegemonious narrative, uh, the dominating perspective, language on which all other experiences are translated into. The fall of the wall also brought about a process of transformation at high speed. It actually happened in five or six years. I mean, not only did we all get literate on the subject matter, digital newspapers came about, and that Volupa uh, Harpa I wrote, I was thinking, well, technology, uh, in a way, brings down hierarchies. COVID brought about some sort of new literacy uh, that is disciplinary. This has a negative side to it as well, as is the case with anything else, because, of course, it brings about issues that are not similar at all. We were mentioning Canclean. He said that all journalists have turned into bloggers. I heard someone say, what about the impact of influencers, as if it were the same thing? Well, we actually are talking about the journalism that puts at stake uh, corporations. It puts at stake a dynamic and a complexity that is not comparable. It assumes different uh, genders, different opinions. Of course, this brings about the different points of view that are combined. All that, well, Patricia was mentioning before the lecture became uh, those that are on the street reporters. They used to be on the streets, but now, uh, giving an opinion, not just an opinion, but giving a description or giving a narrative in all uh, the sections in journalism, they have some sort of grid. It's a talking head with a library behind or with a plant behind. Uh, I mean, it is some sort of standard view. And in a way, Thinking about a person on the street, um, reporting people on the street, it makes us think about the outer space. Of course, everything gets kind of uniformed. And what we say about things is uniformed. I talk about the wall. Well, in connection to the characteristics that globalization will have, I think about the status of globalization, and what about the agenda of biennials and festivals? There is this installed narrative with which I fully agree, or pretty much agree. The status of affairs of things back in the past was not very good indeed. Cuauhtemo talked about the need to have a critical globalization. Didn't you say so? Uh, you talked about this last week. And I'd like you to go deeper into the notions here, if you will, because this makes us think that let's turn COVID into a possibility to debug ourselves, so to speak, no matter how delusional it might be. Thinking about this idea of an instant past or a recent present, uh, the pandemic brought us all onto. Cuauhtemo mentioned we are moving on to a critical globalization. On the other hand, well, this week I was listening to Anna Sokolov, and she said that 
collectors will pay much more attention to local scenes. That is quite significant as well. They will take a look at public interest, public art with far more interest, and the causes of common good as some sort of new humanism that will actually reach art. Art is safe, actually, from an, an uncertain future. Maybe the life of museums and the path of artists could be beneficial or could benefit from the total disgrace that other disciplines have. Let's think about theater. They cannot even think them about themselves. They cannot have a proto they don't even have a protocol that they can invent. So for Argentina, uh, underpinning or thinking global, even though the region will come and save us, is specifically difficult because of the economic crisis. I mean, it is clear that we will have a scene where resources won't be aimed at uh, the media turning global or at su uh, sustaining the old ways, I mean, taking care of different developments in the world, because we will necessarily move on to quite a deep crisis, in my own view. So when it comes to that, as I was mentioning a while ago, I should say, well, the reaction will be, for starters, a possible world. Biennale Sur will have a lot of impact. And with Argentine history always being uh, the national scene, having a first, uh, of course, the political support and the first scene, and having this cosmopolitan desire that is part of the history of art in, Argentine, in Argentina and of those who read publications. Thank you, Matilde. We are there, and let's go to the other side of the ocean to give the floor to Iker. And we wonder, Estrella de Diego is kind of set sailing in the middle of the road. Thank you for your invitation, Diana, and I'd like to thank the team in Bienal Sur. I'm talking about a different kind of reality, not because where I am it's 6 p.m., but because we think that the process that the pandemic brought about is different from Argentina or Brazil or Peru. How about taking a look at an exhibition on Monday, we'll be able to go and dine out to restaurants. And this shows quite a big difference how this pandemic took place from the beginning in Spain. I believe that when the whole thing started, we all had limitations. We didn't make that many cultural recommendations because people didn't have so much free time. We realized that things hadn't been that nice. And we didn't have much time to read. So in the beginning, we all were forced to doing something at quite an important moment. And this happens with intellectuals all over the place. Never before did I have so many possibilities to publish texts from big signatures around the world. You didn't have to look for them. We published texts from Paul Oster, Teju Hall, 
Paolo Giordano or Mona Cholette. And they've given us them for free in some cases. We sometimes paid a fee, but that wasn't quite remarkable. Never before would have been able to publish such a thing hadn't it been for them volunteering. So what happened to all these intellectuals and to those thinkers is that they had the need to say something about it. And they wanted to do so as loud as, as could be. So this was so in as many languages as possible. We wanted to nail on, on it. Some of the texts that had been published on Wuhan Soup had been published on El País newspaper. They wanted to nail on a new reality. We lived the golden age of interviews where you could call anyone on the phone and you could talk about things that you weren't able to express. Uh, sometimes you would say, well, I'm on my way to Basel. So the role of the media has been really very good when it comes to that. And in the middle of the whole uncertainty, we had the possibility to bring about light. How will the world be post-COVID? And this is what we had to do. I agree with an article that was published on the New York Times where the author asked people to stop imagining futures because these are things that are quite paradoxical to think about that it's impossible for us to imagine it. I don't know whether that happened on the other side of the ocean. Cultural agents have been forced to go digital in a forced manner. It's good and it will remain, especially in the world of museums. And it has interested many people. The El Prado director told me that for the first time, many people would visit El Prado because they realized what El Prado was all about, thanks to them taking no, I mean, being aware of its existence on the internet, then it's also very paradoxical to see that this has happened in the world. So in Spain, culture posted many things on the web so that many people could get entertained. So culture made the same old mistake. It wanted to be useful. It seemed it had to be useful so that we wouldn't be like unnecessary. What about transatlantic trips or the concentration of people, crowds of people were not necessary. How about culture? Well, the result is that we were so active that when the government in Spain uh, didn't really rescue culture, we did our own part. It's quite paradoxical because deep down it was some sort of they've been becoming useful because they would do monologues on Instagram and whatnot. And all of a sudden, there was kind of this bailout price, quite legitimately so. So all these paradoxes that have happened on this while are quite interesting. And how will they unfold in the future? Museums are reopening in Spain. They'll eventually do so in Argentina. And they are doing so in a way that has necessarily have to be different. We have to consider uh, temporal space, how many people will travel around the world. We cannot go everyone to the same place to have interviews. Uh, we, of course, discovered that this can be done remote in a remote manner. So this brings about lots of points of interest to see how the future will exist, not just in the field of intellectuals, that uh, are throwing the dice, but how are we going to manage our own lives beginning on this moment and forward? Thank you so much. So Patricia and Selina, who would like to go first? Patricia's microphone is unlocked. Before anything, thank you so much for inviting me, for having me around. And 
I'm very interested in listening to you because I believe that what is surfacing now are actually many words, many words that are a common denominator in our reflections. I thought about talking about the right moment, the moment we are going through. This showed the frail nature of a political and economic system that cannot be supported. And when we think about it from the point of view of how this gets revealed at every point in time and how resistance or reactions are re revealed at every point in time, then I was I would reflect on Jose Carlos' uh, notion, the invisibility of COVID, and on how this uh, story of invisibility brought about, and the paradox term surfaces up again, paradoxically so, made it visible um, that a number of things that Diana places as key and central in all of our discussions, frailty of the moment, inequality, and in cases of countries such as the United States and Brazil, these being totally different countries from the point of view of their cultural history, the issue of gender and racism and violence. Uh, that is, all of a sudden, invisibility brought about, rendered visible something that was discussed yesterday, the brutal nature that appears in the struggle, in the racial struggle. We had been discussing this precisely so in Brazil from years back when Mandem text appeared and when Ailton Krenak started to talk from his place from the place of indigenous groups in Brazil, he started talking about the fact that future is not for sale. And in discussion with Matilde, how about these millions of people who died? If they won't cause that this will bring about some sort of modification, then this will have been a futile effort. The common denominator that I see is we are all talking about the fact that this situation has brought about a lack of stability, of the stability we used to live. Jean Fernandez would say something very interesting, and it is also reflected in connection to the whole thing of the market and our trips. Osami was talking about that, where culture, in a way, became a movement where rather than being able to inhabit the spaces, we were at a rush behind all news and whatever was happening. I don't think that will change. However, I think that we will have to reflect upon it. The idea by Jean Fernandez when he says, maybe so museums will turn far more local, that is, they will go back to their places of location, that doesn't mean we won't go and visit the Viennese Biennale. It means, however, that the way in which we will be thinking about our projects will be somehow differently, will be somehow different. Another common denominator in my mind is the term solidarity. Things appeared, whether we can call them because of the tool or not, I mean, there are a number of attitudes on the part of institutions, private and public institutions, that is, of bringing and making an effort in order to have access to their Itaú brought its library and it made it available. Pina uh, also did something very nice on top of their collections, Mum as well. And on the area of the market, a number of initiatives came about, such as Patia and the group Projecti 
that was one that was created among artists and BJs, and it became something fundamental where projections were uh, placed on buildings, and they became one of the groups that became one of the first few to talk about how important it was to take up other spaces in a different way. So we had projections of the sort of there was a dictatorship, there was some torture. I mean, all the discussions that we had been living through at that time. So I didn't want to focus so much on Brazil's situation. But when you talk about Europe, it is unavoidable for us not to mention Brazil. In Brazil, we are living through an absolutely different situation. We have a government, an administration, where people discuss. There is a public debate on whether we are in front of a person who just denies everything or whether he's a psychopath. And what I wanted to bring about for you, since we talk about the texts and the production, how much along those lines we are working and thinking, then we did two things about it. On the one hand, we carried out in-depth interviews with those that are uh, the major players in culture in Brazil, CESC, a major group in Brazil that invests quite heavily in culture with the secretary and the director of Itaú, Ricardo Taki, etc. And we gave them a voice. We gave them a voice because they somehow had been taken a look at the entire process. But I don't know whether you remember about Dos Anjos. He's a curator and a very important researcher on Nabucco Foundation in Recife. Moisy, he wrote a book. Uh, he was the curator of the 2009 biennial, and the name of it was a little water is enough to navigate. A glass of water is enough to navigate. It was a highly political issue, but it was very optimistic as well. And now, he just published a text that touched me very deeply because it's a very nice one. But it comes very handy to what we are talking about, how important it is to be fully aware of what is happening right now without necessarily attempting to give an answer right now. He found a Deleuze text that referred to Beckett work and that it was quite calling for him that it was possible to create a discussion on the difference between tiredness and exhaustion. And he thought about that. Unlike many moments that we had lived through where tiredness is something that relates to the fact that we are behind objectives, we chase objectives and a desire of whatever is possible. So we work, we work, and we keep working, and at some point we are tired. Then the idea of exhaustion brought about with itself something different. It brought about something that uh, leaves us speechless to name things. And I believe that the insight he had was the following. In Brazil, one of the things that happens is that people no longer know how to talk about the moment we are living through. It's as though we were left speechless or we had run out of words to describe what Bolsonaro can be or to describe what people who showed in such a level of dissociation, lack of solidarity, etc., etc., are beginning to show. And the other thing that has to do with exhaustion brought about something that had to do with no matter that we are thinking about whatever is possible, we really don't know what the limit of that will be. If we are exhausted, then somehow what may happen, what prevails, is the idea that this is as far as we have reached, and that beginning on this will then have uh, the obligation to think how to go through this. 
along Matilda's lines, if we gave the example of the wall, then if the wall fall up, fell apart, what will happen beginning on now? I mean, this is just something I wanted to comment. We, of course, can go over it in more detail, but it was quite conspicuous. It called my attention, and I thought it was really very interesting, at least so, to make me reflect on what is happening right now. Thank you. It's quite interesting, meaning finding terms to explain the situation. Selina. Selina? Selina? She froze. Selina? Well, she's beautifully crystallized, I should say. Hello? Connection got arrested. Can you hear? We can hear. Well, that's good. I see you all have frozen, but I hope that my connection works. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Selina is down as we get her back. Well, as I said before, we connect it with the audience. There are things we can control from our central production, and there are things that escape our hands. They are random. It has to do with how internet works in the places where you are. So unless she gets back, well, she's back, but she's frozen. I am back. Great. Can you hear me well? Loud and clear. So thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me. Biennal Sur was for me a pioneer in the new paradigm that comes along. Why is that so? Because the way that has been found to cross borders with technology without having to move and working in a network with the different institutions is a model that has come to stay for good. And I believe that the moment we are living through right now has something very positive to it. It changes our conscience. There's the possibility for us to change our conscience. It makes us walk up to a responsible, sustainable consumption in the purest sense of the term. We have to reflect what we are investing our resources on. This includes time and whatnot. I think about conferences, press conferences. I work far more than I used to work before, but my resources are invested in a different way. Uh, these are virtual conferences, so I don't have to move from where I am. And that has also come to stay, and it's quite positive. And when it comes to artists, I think that they can give us some good orientation because their intuition has been very well developed. One of the artists that I interviewed when the pandemic got started is Tomas Saraceno. He is quite brilliant. He's remarkable. He believes in um, the change of this paradigm from competition down to cooperation. And I believe that that is something that you do consider very key uh, from Biennale Sur. He said that a way to face a global problem, we all are facing the same problem, and this makes us ready to see or understand the other global problem, which in his view is more serious, that of climate change. So that could be some sort of training where we will change our conscience or, aware or our awareness to deal with other things that we'll have to deal with in a global and interdisciplinary manner. And artists are showing us how this has to be done. I would like to go back to a number of successful examples that happened in Argentina. A gallery, Rolf, it created an exhibition model in this situation, promoted by Andrea Junta. And it's a way to show 
this exhibition from the gallery in to showcase it to other countries. It is a way that is enabled thanks to technology. It helps us cross borders, and I thought it was very original. It had very good content, and this initiative of museums having discussions such as the one I saw last time with Contemoc in uh, Proa are ways of communicating that we have to keep developing, that is being um, part of networks. This is very remarkable and very important. But I also believe that we have to be careful, as Gabriela Rangel says, uh, so that we don't run the danger of cacophony, where we will all be willing to talk rather than to listen to one another. And when it comes to that, I believe that museums can offer some sort of shelter, some sort of spiritual shelter, uh, such as in the Museum of Houston, uh, where we have a model where we were able to find some sort of repair after the lockdown, after the quarantine. But museums have to reinvent themselves. They could as well become, after the quarantine is over, they can become producers of content that will help us walk away from the brick and mortar space and recover public space. And this is something that I can recall is very good from BNL Sur. You were doing it quite well. One of the potential futures for art, regaining, reclaiming public spaces, walking away from institutions, creating social bonds. <coughs> creating communities as well. I'd like to be brief here because I'm sure that everyone must be quite exhausted by now and maybe it's the time for us to move on to questions. Well, it's not actually questions. Rather than this, based on this repertory, maybe we can have keys, um, minor keys, not because they are not important but because we have many. What are the points that you agreed on? And it's also interesting to kind of find a common thread among all three meetings so far, issues that have to do with how we perceive time in a new manner. And here we had these positions, whether to make it forward or uh, go back in time, the relation between time and space, whether it has expanded or not. And at the same time, there are two issues that I'd like to place on the forefront before I give the floor to Anibal. He had been waving at me from before. One of them has to do with the complex situation between the local and the global one. It appeared in the voices of all of you, and it also appears on the texts. I find quite interesting how South America or Latin America talks about what's local and the different way in which this appears, especially when it comes to listening to several European voices that I have been reading over the last few days. They seem to be more connected to what we are living in, uh, being locked down nationally, borders being closed, something that tends more to be in some sort of the checks and balances of the poros nature we were so much used to living in in the last 30 years, a growing porosity. And from my own perspective, these aspects uh, are the ones I'd like to retain, so to speak. The way in which this porosity happens today has to be rethought. But I didn't want to subtract it from the equation. However, when you talk about going back to the local, you talked about uh, neglecting that porosity, or this is what uh, resounded in me. So the way we can think about the possible futures in connection of to the tension between the local and the global ones, this being one of the lay motifs we have been discussing so far in Biennale Sur, I'd like uh, for us to go back to this. And another issue that is quite loud and clear is what is necessary. Iker talked about whatever is extra. Is culture an unnecessary thing? Is it like uh, something that is not really necessary when confronted to life or death? How about being necessary? We have to 
uh, deserve our right to keep living, our right to keep alive. This appeared on many meetings and it appears on many of the contexts here. And this would also happen in connection to these modes of virtuality that happened in many of the voices, thinking about the new reality, thinking about this, not just because of adapting or migrating uh, the real to the virtual world, but again, it, in an attempt for us to rethink us and our existence. I'd like to open up to all the things that have been said. I'll give the floor to Anibal, and then we will start taking part of a conversation. Thank you, Diana. I believe that all participations were quite a wealth of um, intellect, and it would require a long time because, of course, it's very interesting. I'd like to go back to things that I have been thinking so far and I've been working on so far as well. Unfortunately, it's only two. Jose Carlos referred to the turning back or the quest in local traditional cultures. I believe that that has a lot to do with what we have talked about, with what we have read and discussed in Biennale Sur. What we attempt to do, maybe a small bit of sand uh, creating a new contemporary humanism. This new contemporary humanism has a lot to do with two regions in the world, Latin America and Africa. And maybe it is not mere chance the fact that the two non-Latin American countries represented in the meeting we are having here are Spain and France. Spain had to be uh, with two representatives, but Estrella failed on us, uh, Spain and France. Uh, why? Because these are the two countries, well, Spain from the point of view of his uh, regard on Ibero-America and France from his point of view on their look on Latin America is and Africa as well. Well, I said that the presence of representatives from these countries is not out of chance because they are part of the creation of a new philosophy, a new thinking. In a time of globalization, cannot be at the margins of globality, if I may repeat the term. And this contemporary humanism has a lot to do with what um, Maria Tully mentioned. Uh, that is looking um, in a folkloric manner, diving into traditional cultures and traditional elements. We had our own attempt with Capsuchico and Vino at the time with um, the culture key cultures in Tucuman and also in Peru as well. I believe that that is an element that was highly devalued traditionally so in the contemporary world. And we have to uh, go back to the bootstraps of it. As Matilda said, it would be an atrocity if this would happen without leaving any change in us. I believe that we have to change many things. And these include something that Alejandro said. He talked about the intellectuals. No matter there have been, as Iker said, some major intellectual contributions I believe what intellectuals have done so far isn't sufficient in attempting to explain what is going on. Understanding those intellectuals as people who do thinking for a living or who can devote more time to thinking and imagining things rather than those that are in a very specific execution activity. We haven't gotten many major contributions from them. In my own case, the most interesting thing I've read by Santo Silva, and it is not out of chance, the Portuguese thinker and academician. But if we think that for the world that, com that comes next or that is coming next, we should consider or structure a new type of relation between the public and the private notions, then we have to rethink, and I go back to Alejandro's statement on the belief on the part of some intellectuals and on top of that, I would add journalism as well. So I would say that the belief of some intellectuals and journalists is that if they fulfill their duty, they should be critical of the government. If we would be in Brazil rather than in Argentina, that would be their view. But I say so not because I'm an Argentinian, but in general, I think we have to 
generate some thought that can be critical when need be and that can be um, in approval when need be. If we went back to the strict world of culture, evidently so, we all think, or at least we think, that the world of culture was excessively marketed oriented. We were happy at some point because that meant a greater approach between the world of culture and the rest of society because that helped more people to visit museums or that they would appreciate more pieces of art. But then we came to a situation that can be still considered excessive. But of course, that would be a good topic for us to discuss in another panel session. We should go back to this as a whole thing. So there are things we have to change in society. From culture and art, we can contribute to trying to change them. There are things that have to be changed in the world of culture. And we have to understand, and I go back to what Matilda said, that the fall of the Berlin War, uh, Wall did not create the changes that we had thought would happen. Wars didn't finish. This wasn't the end of history. It wasn't the world extension of democracy based on free market because the whole contrary thing happened later. And it would be ideal if we didn't miss out on this opportunity that at a minimum we should try to change the status quo and those who work in the field of thinking and leadership in connection to culture, we should try to lay some foundations and establish a number of thoughts that will help modify things, at least partly so. Thank you, Diana. I give the floor back to you. Who decides to be on the limelight right now? Alejandro? I thought you wanted to take action. Thank you. It's quite interesting. I mean, everything that has been said so far is very interesting. I believe that paramount crisis, global crisis, or national crisis, because we Argentinians are some sort of um, people who are used to gigantic crisis. Crisis have an impact on the future. They build up a wall that makes a future unthinkable. Because, I mean, an emergency demands from all of us to be focused on solving day-to-day -day affairs, finding a solution to what emergency entails. So future is unthinkable in an emergency. And when it comes to that, there is something that Patricia said that struck me as very impressive. I mean, the worst thing that could ever happen to us is to give in in front of such a wall, that the wall will be so gigantic that we are left speechless. If we are left speechless, we are left without a horizon. And then whatever remains is the possibility to live inside the crisis, rather than thinking that what we do in the crisis is connected to the way we are going to leave it behind. So when it comes to that, I believe it is quite clear that we do need words, we do need images, we do need art in its full expression, in, in, in all its disciplines, in all its forms, in order to think about past crises that will help us think about the future. And I wanted to convey that in my own opinion, I go back to the same point. I think the world won't be the same old one. It could be worse, though. And if it were better, at a minimum, we will need to work laying an emphasis on a few things. The world will not continue to be the same old one. It will be better or worse. It's very difficult for us to remain the same. This is a global commotion, as was stated. So for it to be better, we need to vindicate the public field. We need to vindicate democracy. We need to re vindicate the idea of community. We need to 
uh, give um, a high place to solidarity. Se me cortó. Solito. Oh. Solo. The common sense that makes inequality natural and where we see how they become very sensitized in dramatic moments. We need to call upon in cultural terms and in intellectual terms is how to potentiate critical thinking against all the possible forms of those inequalities when exacerbated in order for us to be able to think about a society where we go back to think about those new conditions where we shouldn't be neglecting ever, ever the variants of the cosmopolitan approach because if we are to remain in a local route or in a national route then we will have different types of lockdown. Walking away from the lockdown means being able to engage in dialogue with all the voices, with all expressions, with all images, including the ones where in some contexts are the more inaudible ones. Thank you. I fully agree. There was some sort of connectivity that was low and as all images reinstate, I'd like to read a text that Estrella de Diego sent us over. It's very brief, additionally to thanking and kissing us and hugging us remotely. He apologizes because at some point elements reveal, and this was the moment where his computer became rebellious. So as far as I can read, he could hear or he is able to follow us maybe in, in real time, including. So he talked about action changes the concept of invisibility and future, a dark future. And this happens after every crisis. Things become more conservative. It is strange that all this is established in the middle of an epidemic with everyone at home. This is what is strange. We are in the outer world. We all are. Uh, on our own. We'll all be foreigners and we will have to come back to the world with humbleness and with empathy. Many aspire to the world going back to the way it was before. I believe that this implies understanding that the future cannot be predicted as a matter of fact. No matter how obsessed we are about it, for us to be able to project an extended, an extended present that I believe will last for long. Patricia said it right, there are no words. We are speechless, we have to learn them all over again. And maybe we need to um, be in silence for a while. What do you think about that? In the lockdown, we haven't remained th that silent. Aren't we kind of having a binge of thinking and of talking? How about Zoom meetings, Skype meetings, roundtable meetings? We haven't practiced silence, at least this is what I think. Silence is um, fertile territory for us to invent future possibilities. It was my pleasure to have heard you all, and I embrace you virtually so. Patricia, I just wanted to talk about something that I didn't mention and that has surfaced up right now because of what Alejandro said, the relevance of what Kawatemoc, of what Kawatemoc said. I mean, if we are not giving up in front of what is happening, what renders itself clear is to replenish the social fabric. I mean, if I were to bring about examples in Brazil, it is quite evident, very evident. I mean, 
there are no um, alternatives. There is a government that is clearly fascist, and it's as though the opposition had vanished into thin air. But at the same time, along those lines uh, of Medina, there are quite a number of movements, uh, so to speak. They are not cellular, but there are a number of movements that are happening that are bringing about a light on how important they are as a movement. So when that gets reorganized as one single thing, or when we find some leadership that is kind of homogeneous for that in mind, then we'll be able to get started to think about a concept of a state where that is under discussion. It's quite odd because there are two images that I uh, feared talking about. One of them were the cartoons, the coyote that um, runs in the air after the road runner, and a song that I love that I've been lingering on since February by Chico Buarque. You know, m my dear friend, things are dark, completely dark or black. I wrote a very lengthy text talking about what meant walking through the darkness. And all of a sudden, I think that there's this affair in front of us. When I say that we have to keep up a global and critical position, one of the elements I have in mind is, well, a very important effect in our narrative. And I believe that this is what what Alejandro suggested, aimed at. Well, actually, intellectuals in Latin America continue to be intellectuals from the national state. So while a defect of uh, the universalist European thinking is that, well, the state of abstraction, well, it excites us to uh, oppose the president, and the president is excited with opposing us or attracting us. And that hides a problem, because that is the inefficacious agent. It is very powerful, because, of course, they control the armed forces and the public expenditure, the accumulation of resources that doesn't happen through the capitalist commercial path. It keeps control on tax, taxes that are paid, and these two players turn of it an unmanageable tyrant. But when it comes to thinking, listening to Monica Nagula from Tax Media Collective, well, it gives me more of a thrill. And understanding Moby, and let me make a joke here, being able to understand how Brazil in the North is working, I believe that the United States are the Brazil in the North. And we have to start thinking about the Washington Bolsonaro. But what I am trying to say here is the following. Our attitude has to bring about the following. It's learning from deception. We cannot wait until we are shown the way to go by intellectuals. It's quite a big pleasure and quite an encouragement to be able to listen to options, no matter how failed or different they may be, because they have been thought deep down inside and with detail. If you read Anna Singh and uh, the marvelous book of uh, the mushroom to the end of the world, and well, how Japanese mushrooms are being grown in areas devastated by industry can only walk us to the latest of circumstances in specificity. And that is my own impression of things. There is some beauty to the fact that someone, like Haraway, 
such as Gambon. Think, because they always are in this role of challenging. These are thoughts that are happening, either too late or too early. I don't know why we waited for so long. Yo te aviso porque... Papá, no, no, está bien, está bien. ¿Todo eso? Listo, gracias.
So, uh, the right synteny, even though of this uh, discussion, we would have Mari Carmen Ramirez, who somehow can be regarded as a representative of that figure. Nonetheless, we remain open to comments. Maybe Philippe, he's nodding in affirmation. He moves quite restless as well. Maybe he wants to say something. I just wanted to go back on to the issue of um, how temporary exhibitions got interrupted and uh, how going back to the permanent exhibitions are important. This is quite paradoxical because this arrest, so to speak, will reduce solidarity. Do you understand what I mean? I mean, if we have less projects and if we invite less experts and we um, invite less uh, transportation, I mean, the artistic community as a whole will reduce the rate or the speed. There will be many people who are already in a complicated situation. And I believe we have to be very careful when it comes to that. It's not good to go slower. It's not necessarily good. We, as a matter of fact, realized, specifically in Europe, that this lockdown brought us to going back to local, not only from a cultural and artistic point of view, but also from an economic perspective. We saw how we have to relocalize productions mentally and intellectually. This will also make us change our viewpoint on globalization. And maybe it will force us to having a more direct look on what's local, the period that has been totally unheard of is also one where transportation and travels have been reduced. And this forces us to thinking about our ideas and our projects. We have to think about things in a different way. These big artistic manifestations, which as a matter of fact are unique points where everybody comes from all over the world, creating transportation from many parts around the world, well, maybe the model of Biennale Sur, a Biennale that gets inscribed on the local, uh, maybe one of future and art, the world of art and culture that will be recontextualized. Thank you, Philippe. Guautemoc. I hope I can express my own concern that the term local, and I do follow what Philippe is saying, is hiding a big peril of becoming terribly dangerous. What this establishes is the possibility for imposing national ideologies and uh, the modality of exclusion, specifically speaking, to um, the geographical area that is near. So against our expectations, 
local could mean the opportunity to render conflicts visible, the conflicts that are in my place, and to distribute vi visibility, it should be possible for violence of representation to be reduced to a minimum. That is the flag that has been raised by fascist governments. This is the element of reference. And otherwise, this will be the way in which power will use subordinates to generate a government that is based on identity fantasy that is highly masculine, the patriarchal Latin American sovereignty. So I do feel that the check and the balance that was represented by the circuit, contemporary art in particular, being a place of politization and of criticism to representation, challenging identities. This is something that I regard as a very serious loss. It doesn't compare to the other problem, collections and heritage. We have to try and find how to defend from the negative look that people give it sometimes. But it doesn't have to do with the commitment with the local. We are safeguarding something that belongs to humankind, which sometimes is located here, unfortunately so. It's very serious, and I think about it based on the Peruvian situation and what Carlos said. Mali, such an important institution, is having such a dramatic crisis right now. And we are in front of a situation where there is no structure of support that will be sufficiently big in order for us to see it as an international problem, that Mali should be one of our nodes. i just like to finish with the suggestion saying that I'm not normally comfortable with the decision that the cultural field has to um, be forgiven in a way, nor am I sure that trade in and of itself should be a problem. The problem is that the structure of trade is not being modified right now so that we can combine mm, meaning and trading. But if there wouldn't be any trade, then the cultural field would be one dictaminated in a catastrophic manner. If there wouldn't be any trade enabled, we would be in a cultural situation that would be highly deteriorated. So I feel that we tend to generate structures that become like single crops. They don't operate in a complex ecology. And all of a sudden, we have structures that don't interact with publics and that they are underpinned by assumptions and structures that are delivered to a flood where the owners, those who know less about culture, have the power to decide. And then they want to go about the box office. We have to understand that the field of culture has to support a diversity of structures so that we can remain independent. While you were having the floor, Quauhtémoc, a comment came from the audience where they considered problems of communication, not in terms of connectivity, but the relationship between leaders, intellectuals, and citizens from all so walks of life. But your comment addressed that issue quite in detail. Nonetheless, I leave it open. And I add another comment along the lines of those. They asked you, I mean, a while ago, we talked about the death of painting. So are we in front of the death of museums, at least the way we have known it so far? And it goes around several of the comments that have been mentioned so far. Well, I'm out of connection. This was expressed by some museum directors in the art newspaper. Yes, Iker. The death of museums, as it seems, is pretty much more than a statement, a theoretical statement. Last time, 
the International Council of Museums issued a report where they said that one third part of museums will close and this will have a gap. And in this um, kind of forward thinking situation where museums will base themselves on permanent collections, this brings about inequality because if we have to face such a paradigm with a powerful collection in the 20th century, such as MoMA or Pompidou, doesn't compare to the situation of a museum that doesn't have those many skills. And this is one of the problems beyond the fact that, that many museums will close their doors. Some will be forced to doing so. In Spain, they will all suffer as weeks go by. El Prado or Reina Sofia, on a weekly basis, they lose half a million dollars. That also happens with Venice. As a result of the book by Cetis, if Venice dies, and the conclusion is that if Venice dies, then everything dies. It will die because of tourism or without tourism. So how will we manage to combine all these things together? A more rational approach to visit museums or to manage museums, having to do with people wanting to grasp the world, and well, collections that are highly unequal. unequal. We don't have such a problem because our museums are free of charge, at least not uh, losing any box office. Well, having them open costs quite a lot of money, even when they don't have any money paid to on the entrance ticket. I wanted to talk about the box office. Yes, please, go ahead. Please do. To Kawatemoc. I don't know whether that is the idea of going local. We had discussed about that in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, quite extensively. I'm talking about the local notion. The museum would have come from the last few years working a lot on democratization, going democratic with the public. So having a bigger tax uh, box office record meant it was more democratic. But maybe we have to now talk about how important representation is all about, that is, how we should be participating, how people will be able to participate as a matter of fact. And maybe so, that can lead us into thinking about how to generate local solutions, not in the sense of the term that you alluded to, because it would be terrible. I mean, now we are going back to a nationalist view. But on the contrary, thinking about museum solutions in regions around the museum, or how the museum will go there, or how it'll bring about different accumulations. We have very major cases in Brazil and the periphery, what we refer to as the periphery. So that's what I wanted to talk about when it comes to alluding to the local part of it. Wow might want to answer Patricia, and then we'll give the floor to Anibal. Well, that's a perspective where you are right, but then how do we complicate the local thing? Nonetheless, I feel that I never thought that the box office issue had to do with democratization. I did have a conflict in my team with my director, Garcia de la Torre, uh, that view on the fact that the number of visitors meant democratization. It was social power. It was libidinal economy. That is, the fact that a cultural space may generate public excitement that we should move from an economy of elite institutions connected to a structure of educational obligation down to places where people will vote with their feet, well, that is, in my mind, an element that not in the field of all museums, but at least so in the artistic field, uh, 
um, it's not that ignorant people are not welcome, but this is that we need to reivindicate on that, that is modifying the cultural economy uh, in connection to not being something that is lost in uh, the emptiness of intellectuals rather than something, rather than being something that is interesting for people or, or gives them a thrill. When it comes to that, I'm not convinced of how valuable free access to museums can prove to be, not because I think that people will have a high appreciation for what they pay, but rather because having a structure that will encourage on a meritocratic manner that the museum will generate that interest or that excitement is a useful element when it comes to deciding on how we operate, allowing museums rather than the nation state to be the ones that could say. There is uh, free access today. The fact that this gets used to attract audiences and benefit a number of sectors and the autonomy they represent in practice this is an element where the box office has a role to play. This is why I've always been quite reluctant to the doctrinary element of free access to museums because, and Iker made some allusion to this, at this point in time where there's this feeling that everything is free of access because it's on the web, well, the capitalist structure of this environment is masked the end of the press, the powerful presence of Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook as global companies. And on the other hand, the small problem that we have, actually, we are in this situation of the strike by the Spanish cultural institutions faced with the impossibility to under to, un to underpin an operative culture or an operative situation. So to what an extent do we manage to lead social energies? And part of the money should be pointing out to a flow of energy. I distrust, that might be my dogmatic part, I distrust the way in which Latin America, the uh, horrible inheritance of capitalism makes us think that money equals sin equals shit, to be honest about it. So we lose sight of the whole thing because we think it's uh, a sin. Well, without coming down to sin, I do agree with uh, how you are suspicious of the entire situation. This is on the one hand, well, there are very different national contexts on the subject matter, but there also are, well, a number of things where we are locking on the, knocking on the door of the state in the best sense of the term, thinking that these are funds that have to be destined to. Under these discussions that were introduced by Alejandro, by yourself and by several others, if we are in government for subjects, or are we in government for the financial capital? If we are in government for subjects, the state, rather than having 0 .0 something percent for culture, will assign more resources to culture, and whether for free or not, they will substantiate this. I don't really know how things are managed, how funds are managed in Spain, and maybe it's not the right time for us to discuss this precisely. But I do believe that there is something to the structures and to institutions that states have to be able to support, because it's public heritage. It's the capital that each nation has in the best sense of the term nation. And it's worthwhile to revisit on it and to vindicate it may be going back to this imagination of a past that I'd like for us to remain with so we can continue it in the future, in the possible future. And going back onto something that you stated, Cuauhtémoc, what resounded in me is the experience that we were able to carry out in Cucutec, uh, where the cultural and artistic activity is the one that ends up being demanded by the community 
because it replenishes a number of conditions that have to do with presence and that have to do with a space to reflect upon this condition of hot border the city has and the problem with migrations. And over the course of the last four years where this project has been up and running, we do see in the local venue, on the local seat, what this movement has represented in terms of providing citizens with a space to think and reflect and in order to take up the streets so as to meet with others and to be able to listen to what they have to say. And in the field of culture and in the field of cultural and artistic practices, these were the ones that largely enabled this. And so this would be a way of going over what's local along the lines of what Patricia was saying, giving a way or giving a space to subjects down in this process, I mean, to citizens from all walks of life uh, based on these proposals, based on these invitations. Whatever Cuauhtémoc talked about would give way to many discussions, but I'll just talk about uh, the notion you were talking about based on the influence of what's local, we might come to xenophobia or nationalism. We are living in a world where nationalism has been considered from the core of the world, from the United States presidency, and xenophobia, and the lack of respect for minorities of all walks of life stem from that place. So I believe we don't have to be afraid so that the influence of what is local might end up in nationalism, but rather to be able to reach globalization from diversities, from each and every one of us being diverse. And I cannot think of the right term right now, but from what is domestic from each country and from our own insights. This is what Jose Carlos considers when he talks about going um, more respectful for what's global. If I may add something, I mean, using or taking into consideration what Cuauhtémoc talked about, it's expanding what's local. Local in some museums is related to what they have around or to the artists that are central in a scene, but the local side of it can also mean exploring other cultural practices or practices of knowledge. And the expansion of local also means collaboration, international collaboration that is fundamental and that provide a wealth of notions. That's definitely the case. I believe there is a wealth of notions. There is a wealth in the term local that has to be given an upgrade. We have to upgrade the local concept the one that we used to talk about 20 years ago. Lots of discussions are happening right now in connection to native practices or aboriginal practices. This is a speech should come more often from Latin American countries rather than from Europe. If that is the discussion that will take place or that will be taking up a place on the table. What's local? Can I be allowed a second? Alejandro needs to leave, and he'd like to make a comment before, so who could we? Your microphone is muted, Alejandro. I just wanted to thank Anibal and Diana and everyone around here. This is an extraordinary dialogue. I'm deeply sorry, but I had another commitment to honor, and I'll have to be present somewhere else virtually so in the next few minutes. So I wanted to say goodbye and to congratulate you because as was stated, this is a very important experience that has to be kept up and we have to multiply this type of conversations and efforts. So I send you a virtual hug, thank you. So sorry, but Jose Carlos and Anibal wanted to take the floor, yes. I would like to go back to what we were saying before, both internationalism of the left wing, the socialist international, down to the capitalist internationalism. They have always turned um, a blind eye to local things. 
when we talk about going from local to global, our consideration is that we have to be integrated in globalization from our own diversity. And I'll give an example, but it is one we are quite careful with Diana to keep up. In Epoi Nest, speaking in French, uh, uh, Philippe Regnier speaks in French while he could actually speak in English. This would help more people understand English rather than French. There are more people speaking English than French, but we had him speak French to respect local languages. The same has been done with African or Arab artists because we believe that you have to integrate yourselves from your own perspective and from your own language. And that has to do with integrating to diversity from your own local signature, from your own community. This is the thinking behind. I know I may look like a wishful thinker because I talk about things that are short of utopic, but if we do talk about them, it is because we don't think they are utopic, but they are part of some utopias that can be revisited. Matilde and Cuauhtémoc. Cuauhtémoc. We could defend something that has already happened. There are lots of participants in artistic fields and also of society in general. Where we are modernized in such a way we can all talk about our own localities. We can report our local health with lots of knowledge. We can establish the tragedy that we cannot set ourselves free from some specific mechanisms from the past. But we are delocalized, so to speak, so that even though I do respect and I believe that the expectation that we should be speaking our own language is beautiful from our own place, well, actually, we have been so sluggish that we have no repair possible. We, we are beyond repair. And what about us, cultural practitioners, so to speak? My statement had to do with the concern that those cultural practitioners, and this is a controversial position, and I'd like to go about this softly, we are reestablishing identities and our possibility to keep up oversight on the effects of identification is reducing, is being reduced in connection to the circumstances we all are living through. And on the contrary, there are a number of radical events that are happening that are quite major when we no longer perceive the world from a Western perspective means that we have to try to understand what is happening, politically speaking, in the different Chinas, seriously thinking how hegemonies, local hegemonies, will crack down and that the domination that had to do with the local culture will luckily so um, go down the drain. And what could be useful when it comes to talking from a given place? We will need to count on the most cosmopolitan bookcase possible. I understand the good intention behind that localized diversity. But I'm under the feeling that this experience has to give way to the fact that we are, have already gone out from local. We have gone beyond local. We can no longer find where the south is. We might, however, lose our north, seriously so, when we think that we might have some orientation. But I understand that mine is a radical position in that direction. I'm always concerned whenever I confront myself with the local thing, there appears a romance rather than the chronic, the chronicle of fatality 
of living under some sort of sta state oppression, under some racism arrangement, under some failure of construction of institutions, under a very local structure that is quite specific that is quite specifically connected to limitations. I do understand, Medina, what your position is, and I think it is quite interesting to see it from a radical perspective. But in the case of Brazil, for instance, well, it's almost exactly the contrary. It is as though in the last 10 years, we would have gone back and rethink the importance of colonial history and scrabbacher in Brazil. I mean, in contraposition to what you had to say, far from having a discussion on what's local or having some sort of reductionism, talking about awareness racing, how important a number of things are. The fact that Brazil is not clearly part of the history of Latin America for Brazilians, the fact that in Brazil, in the last 10 years, we have started having Latin American art come down our land. The fact that in Brazil, we have the discussion that is happening today, a very serious one, on the place of racism, is almost impossible for us not to focus our attention on this. In the last Video Brazil Biennial, we placed the No Medina piece, uh, a black guy who says, I've had enough of it. And it was almost, I don't say censored, but people came along and said, you want to discuss the issue of slavery, even this day and age. That's what I meant by by that, I meant to that localization, having a focus of light on this and the indigenous issue I was mentioning before. When you have a discussion on whether artists are indigenous artists or whether artists can be indigenous, then we have to listen to what we have to say and see what this is all about. It, it's only that. Good. Selina or Matilde, did you want to say anything? Or else, while you think whether you want to say anything else, I didn't say that when we talk about managing resources and see what is it that we consume, we include information. When it comes to journalism, people became aware of the issue of fake news and what type of information they are consuming. And that was a positive balance for the newspapers that have a reputation for being serious journalists. At a point where journalism was going through a critical moment, we are giving new value to going back to reliable sources. Maybe Matilde and Iker uh, shared the same um, opinion. There was a report that got published about that. Very briefly, I should say that I also have a meeting um, in a while, and I'd like to apologize because I'll have to leave this meeting. But in connection to what Selena is saying, it is true, even though there was this dissemination, as Iker was saying, that was the first month. Let's agree on the fact that that happened largely in March. This proliferation and generosity, this, man uh, this joint effort to disseminate and reach out. Even though this existed, it served the purpose of reprofessionalizing, or maybe at the end of the whole thing, it'll serve to that end after the lockdown and after the pandemic. I've been very concerned with the issue, the existence of the press. And I recently drew the conclusion that the press will have to be treated 
such as museums treat opera. That is, we will have to invent systems so that public resources will support the existence of research journalism, critical journalism, because the fact is that journalism as a business is broken, broken for good. And the damage, the social damage that this is causing, I mean, that we should have a return to the vision of distinct powers from different um, perspectives to force the media to serve them is facilitated by the fact that there is this loss of feasibility, of economic feasibility or sustainability. And the problem is even more serious when I talk about the Mexican case, the corrupt relation that was necessary between the government and the media because the media made a living on the government paying them a fee is the basis that um, it ended up with their own existence. We are in a very serious situation, and I go back to the point. The nation state as such serves no purpose. The question that remains open is how are we going about using the force of public violence, and what about the concentration of tax resources? These two issues will have to happen without any discourse on sovereignty or identification, talking about specific needs and options. And a very specific area is the creation and the sustainment of critical culture. I don't see it happening in any other way. I was thinking a while ago about a few galleries in Mexico who did something that is unheard of. They joined efforts to represent artists in a moment of crisis with the idea that if any of the artists would sell, the money would be shared between the galleries. So I thought, it's great. This is the solution that an article by the London Review Books talked about 10 years ago, before this problem became evident. Let's go about how things did uh, happen in radios. Let's uh, collectivize the media. Let's count clicks so that we can pay based on those resources. We'll have to reshuffle things in this direction because the tragedy that will be presented by not having any media will be a final one. I honestly don't think we can sustain the field of information as um, was sustained, uh, as bourgeoisie was sustained, as a privilege of classes. Well, the end of the media, of the print media, is um, something that has to do with results. Eker, let's talk about poetry and occasional suicides. Well, it's the first time for me to take a look at things a little bit more optimistically. At least so, in Spain, things are like this. There has been a movement of people. They got used to paying for things that used to be free before, such as paying for Netflix or HBO. And maybe they can as well get used to paying for news. It's a global movement that moves ahead. As Cuauhtémoc was saying, supporting the media um, brings about the peril that if they are paid by the state, of course, they will no longer be any critical at all. So it's the first time in quite a long time for us to get paid by people just to read news, such as they pay to watch 400 series every week. Good. We have come down to a different dimension, which is actually not different. It's another dimension, but it's one of the paths that are present in this dialogue. And I am happy that we cannot conclude. We are just postponing it for another occasion. I'd like to thank you so much for the wealth of exchange, for the wealth of all comments, and for the wealth of whatever remains open. And in thanking you, I'm thanking the 400, uh, the 1,400 people who are on the Spanish channel and the people who are on the English channel. We've had news, we had comments, some alarms also 
were sent our way because interruption, uh, communication got interrupted at some point in time. And I'd like to take advantage of this so as to say that in a few minutes, everything will be compiled. It is stored. So if you want to take a look at what you may have missed out live, it'll be online in a few minutes, in, a, in the next few minutes. So I have nothing more to say. And since I'm running out of words, as Patricia was saying, and also because it's always necessary to listen to silence, to think everything that was exchanged in this session. I'd like, you so, I'd like to thank you so much. And unless Anibal would like to say anything else, it's mercy on my part. I'd, I'd like to thank you so much. And these three hours of discussion we had are an open door to many more hours that we will have to keep having. So thank you so much. Thank you all. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It was really remarkable. Bye, Animal. Bye, Diana. Thank you. Bye, Kawatemok.